Ah, hey everybody. So yeah, welcome back to the Ground Truth track. Uh, this is Andrew Morris from Endgame. Uh, you guys already clapped, so that's taken care of. Uh, just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors who make this conference happen. Uh, they're awesome. You should all take some time to visit them. Uh, also want to mention this is being live streamed and recorded. Um, if you guys could turn off the ringers on your phones, that would be great. Um, and also, please, nobody, we don't have anybody back there, but don't stand in the back because that's a fire lane. Uh, so we got to keep people out of the back. Okay, without further ado, I will turn it over. Thanks. All right, let's get this party started. So this is Flaying the Blockchain Ledger for Fun, Profit, and Hip Hop, and that title will make a lot more sense shortly. My name is Andrew Morris. Before I even get started, I want to go ahead and acknowledge a bunch of people that helped me make this talk happen. Um, my buddy Colin did a lot of this research with me. Uh, it all kind of came from us sitting in my room drinking and like, oh, this would be a funny thing if we did it. Uh, Chris Donaher is one of my coworkers who helped me a bunch with a lot of the database queries because I suck at that kind of stuff. Dr. Richard Seymour, Esquire, Junior, MD, uh, one, of our data, <laughs> one of our data scientists um, and, a, and a friend of mine who helped me provided a lot of moral support and just helped, helped me get through a lot of the really hard stuff. Uh, my coworker Bobby, who <laughs> probably doesn't want his last name on this. Um, my roommate Andrew, who like in a fit of disaster drove me to his office because I needed a faster internet connection than my shitty third world country South Carolina internet. Um, a guy named Edward uh, Iskandarov, who he wrote the library, the blockchain parsing library that I actually ended up relying really heavily on and checked it into GitHub like a month ago, um, which is great. Um, oh, damn it, I didn't do that to do. There's a guy on YouTube, there's a guy on YouTube, um, I'm the worst. Uh, I'm gonna have to follow up with his actual name. He has a series on explaining Bitcoin from beginning to end. It's like a five hour YouTube series where he basically like reads through the Bitcoin paper and ELI fives, everything on there. Um, a guy named Tom Gebhar, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he wrote a really awesome tutorial on like how to parse the blockchain ledger. Um, and I'll, I'll link to all this stuff. Kurt Barnard, uh, my friend and roommate who helped me again with uh, making a lot of this stuff happen, getting through some of the problems I ran into. Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever the hell he is, this Bitcoin is genius and obviously none of this would happen without him inventing it or them or whatever. Uh, the Bitcoin documentation, the developer documentation is exceptional. The two guys that got in a fight two, sh two schmoocons ago that led to me making the worst joke of all time and uh, Endgame, the company that I work at for just being supportive of the research and letting me do it. Um, and with that, let's get started. So um, I tweeted a link just now. My Twitter is Andrew underscore 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 Morris. I tweeted a paste bin link that's going to have all of the hashes and links and queries that I'm going to be referencing here, just in case you guys want to actually follow along. Thank you, Amanda, for making that recommendation. Um, this is the actual layout of the talk that I'm going to give today. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Andrew Morris. This is my Twitter handle. I work on the R&D team at Endgame. Um, my background is in offensive uh, computer stuff. Uh, I was a pen tester for a long time, did a lot of red team work and stuff like that. I've been doing computer stuff for a really long time, my life considered, and it's surprising how bad I still am at it. I dropped out of high school a couple years ago and I don't really feel like doing that anymore. And my favorite things are computers, music, and tweeting stupid stuff. Um, just to kind of like get it completely out there, today I'm just talking on behalf of myself. This is my own recreational research. I'm not talking on behalf of my employer. I'm just talking about technical observations. Um, Endgame doesn't do anything with blockchain or Bitcoin. So this, again, this is just me. Um, I am not a Bitcoin expert, which is, I guess, a little weird because I'm playing one right now. But Bitcoin and blockchain are massively, massively, massively complicated. Um, I've read a lot about it, and I understand it a decent amount, but it's still very, very complex. Um, you're probably not going to walk away from this talk with a really intricate understanding of blockchain. You're going to have a better understanding of it, um, but I really highly recommend that you actually read about it yourselves, and hopefully that'll um, I'll facilitate that happening. And please let me know if you see anything that's inaccurate. You can just shout it at me right now. I don't care. Don't worry about embarrassing me or anything like that. Um, so just to give this a little bit of... Um, a little bit of uh, framing. This guy, um, Martin Shkreli, tweeted on August 26, or on August 26, 2015, he bought the Wu Tang Clan, the exclusive Wu Tang Clan album that they had been secretly recording for two million dollars. He bought it exclusively, so he bought it. He got a physical copy of the record. Um, he bought it in secret at the time, and it later came out that he was the one who purchased it. 
Um, in February 11th, 2016, the same guy tried to buy the new Kanye West album, The Life of Pablo, for $10 million on Twitter by tweeting at Kanye West and writing these letters to Kanye trying to buy this. Um, and then on February 14th, 2015, Martin Shkreli tweets, who the fuck has my $15 million? I need my fucking money back. Oh, I need my money back. This isn't a fucking joke, WTF. Somebody named Daquan said he was Kanye's boy and I signed the deal to buy Palbo and sent the Bitcoin, call the police, this is bullshit. And I saw this tweet at the time and I, and I, saw, and I saw this and I know just enough about Bitcoin to know like scheme hands went on, I can probably <laughs> figure this thing out. So then I had the question, um, is it possible to actually find this transaction and figure out, like find it on the ledger? Right? $15 million is a lot of money. It's a non-trivial amount of money. Um, and I knew just enough at the time about Bitcoin to know that all transactions are broadcast everywhere. Um, so the thought is, why don't I replicate, and the, again, the ledger's unencrypted, it's everywhere. I knew just enough to know that it was maybe possible. Um, so I'm gonna replicate the entirety of the blockchain ledger and I'm gonna search it somehow, and I'm going to find this transaction. I'm gonna see if I could locate this specific transaction in the ledger. So the query is basically gonna look like, given a date range, find any transactions that fell under a certain dollar amount at the time. So my approach is actually pull apart the blockchain, like get the ledger, get the actual blockchain ledger, parse out all of the raw Bitcoin transactions, put it into a format kind of like this, um, shove the data into a database that I can actually ask questions of, write some queries, and figure it out from there. So before I go any further, Oh wait, and hang on, this is actually like pseudo query language of like what I actually am trying to do to locate this thing. Um, so raise your hand if you're familiar with Bitcoin, if you've heard of Bitcoin before, okay. All right, great. So most people have heard of Bitcoin. So just to give like a quick overview, and I mean like really quick, um, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's kind of the first cryptocurrency as far as I know, at least the first of its kind. It's peer to peer. So there is no trusted third party, which means there's no, there's no PayPal, there's no Venmo, there's no one brokering the transactions. Everything actually happens from one person to another person. It's distributed. It's kind of like cash, except on the internet. Whereas if you have $100 in your wallet and somebody runs up to you and they punch you in the face and they take your wallet, you can't go to the US Mint and ask them to refund your $100 that you got stolen. Just the same way that if somebody takes your Bitcoin private keys, or if they spend your Bitcoin, you can't unspend the Bitcoin. It is cryptographically infeasible for a number of different reasons. Um, the ledger is distributed amongst a network of people who want to be a part of the network. So that means that the actual, the itemized ledger of all transactions is held by everyone. Um, it uses something called proof of work to prevent double spending, which basically just means that you can't spend a coin that's already been spent unless you put in the actual computational, like they call them votes, but unless you crunch the CPU and you actually brute force the proof of work in order to do so. And a proof of work is basically something that is hard to get the first time, but easy to verify. So basically given a hash or something like that, like it's easy for me to say, oh, this, this thing, this proof of work is good once I already know the answer, but it's hard to be the first one to actually achieve the proof of work. I'll go into that a little bit. Um, everything's auditable back to the Genesis block, which is the first ever blockchain block that ever happened all the way back to the very beginning. Coins are actually mined with CPU, so you actually cryptographically bring them into existence the same way, kind of like how you mine gold. Um, you put in work, you put in CPU power, and you actually are rewarded with coins. Um, there's actually also a non-Turing complete Bitcoin scripting language as a part of it, which as if it couldn't get any more complicated. There's a programming language that goes with it. Um, it takes about 15, new blocks are mined every 15-ish minutes, which basically means that um, a, it takes 15 minutes to validate a transaction. And if you wanna know more about it, I really re highly recommend that you read the paper. So when you send somebody Bitcoin, you're, you're, you are um, signing a coin and you're letting them know like, hey, you're basically saying, now you are the one who is going to be able to sign, you are the one who is going to be able to spend this coin. The transaction is broadcast everywhere. 
and everyone knows everything that happens, and the network regulates itself with something called difficulty, which basically just allows the blockchain network to continue to replicate every 15 minutes. When there's more people on the network, it's harder to mine Bitcoin. When there are less people on the network, it's easier to mine Bitcoin. And the dollar value fluctuates because that's how economics works. Is Bitcoin anonymous? Kind of. It's anonymous in that you don't know who's making transactions, but everyone knows that every transaction takes place. So in some ways, it's more anonymous than cash. In other ways, it's less anonymous than cash. Um, it can be tumbled to be harder to track, and it basically depends on the OPSEC of the person when you're talking about spending Bitcoin. Wallets can be created offline, which basically just means um, you, can create, you can send Bitcoin to a wallet without actually having to talk to the, or you can receive Bitcoin without actually having to talk to the internet, which is weird, but you can't spend it. Bitcoin is actually very secure. It uses known secure cryptographic pro protocols. It uses things that are kind of like widely accepted as being secure in the crypto world. Um, attacks are possible. There's something called like a 51% attack, which is where half of the people on the blockchain ledgers, half of the members collude together to change something all at the same time. It's very, very unlikely. Um, and most of the actual attacks on Bitcoin involve just having shitty operational security. So talking about the actual blockchain itself, the blockchain ledger is a list of every transaction that's ever happened. It's a giant linked list that constantly grows in size. And the longest chain, the longest trusted chain, the longest chain is the one that's trusted, which is basically the widely acknowledged, the cryptographically verified blockchain ledger. The one, the one that everyone agrees on that's the longest is the one that's, tr that's trusted. Um, Everything is hashed on hashed on hashed, so you can't change anything that's ever happened in the past without affecting everything moving forward, which basically means once something's on the ledger, as soon as another block gets on top of it, you can never change the thing that happened unless 51% of people agree to roll back. Um, the blockchain is made up of blocks, as you could probably imagine. Blocks are made up of transactions. Transactions are made up of inputs and outputs. An output is a wallet sending coins to somebody else. It's basically you saying, this person is going to be able to spend these coins at some point. And an input is somebody acknowledging that, referencing your transaction, then making another output to somewhere else. This is relevant at some point. So if you want to actually access the blockchain, this is like the plebeian way to do it. And I say that like kind of joking. But you can go to blockchain explorers, like blockchain.info, stuff like that, which are ways that you can click through the ledger and actually go and browse wallets, browse transactions, stuff like that. There's lots of them. There's even an offline one that you can get that actually parses the ledger yourself. I'll get on that a little bit. This is what it looks like. Um, it's not terribly clear here, but the height basically means like which block it is in order. The first block was block number one. It had height of one. And then as it increases, so on and so forth. The age, self-explanatory. Transactions is the amount of transactions that take place inside of that given block. Total spent is the USD value of all of those transactions added up. Relayed by basically means like this is the, this is the person, this is the um, group, or this is who advertised, the advertiser of whoever mined that block, whoever brought it into existence. And then the size is just the data size of the block itself. Uh, you can look at Bitcoin addresses, which is Bitcoin wallets. Um, you can look at given transactions on websites like these blockchain explorers. But unfortunately, you can't actually do what I needed to do, my use case, which is basically I need to know all transactions that happen in this value at this given time. There's no way to ask that of blockchain explorers that currently exist. There's no API exposed for that. So this, this is, again, this is a reminder. This is the kind of query that I need to do-ish, but there's no way to do that on blockchain explorers because they don't expose the data to you in that way. There's some potential cheat codes that you could use, like some shortcuts. Um, WebBTC.com actually has an entire dump of their database. It's like once every day, and they have the previous four days that you can download. Or you can generate it yourself with ABE, which I think stands for a blockchain explorer. Um, you can actually also download a Docker file that does the entire thing for you, because it's a little bit of a pain in the ass to get running. Um, somebody Dockerized it, and it's mega, mega easy to get running. I did it. Um, but when you're parsing out the entire blockchain ledger, it ended up just being a shitload of data. And I was like, eh, I don't necessarily want to do that. So let's talk about actually ripping the ledger apart itself. So the ledger is made up of DAT files. Uh, there's currently, there's about 600, about, give or take, 600, 128 megabyte DAT files. Um, they're named as such. Each DAT file that you get when you install like Bitcoin Core and you replicate the ledger, each DAT file is a serialized binary blob. 
Um, each dat file contains blocks, each block contains transactions, and each transaction contains inputs and outputs. The data structure is complex only if you don't know anything about data structures, which I did not. So this is like my military grade PowerPoint um, skills of like actually visualizing to you what the ledger looks like. You've got the block header, which is the header for the, it's just some metadata about the block. I'll talk about what's in each. Then you've got this big transaction thing, an output section and an input section, and then itemized inputs and outputs here. And they, there's blocks on blocks on blocks on blocks. So if you actually want to get the ledger, the good way, the right way to do it is to install Bitcoin Core or install like a Bitcoin mining client and let it sit there and replicate the ledger from the blockchain, from the Bitcoin network. So it means actually like pulling in, um, like actually building the ledger from all of the other members of the network. You need to have about 100 gigs allocated for this. Currently, at this very point in time, uh, the ledger is about 80 gigs total. The easy way is I'll just upload a torrent file of all this if any of you guys actually want it. Just pay attention. I'll, I'll tweet about it or something like that. Um, it'll be a lot faster. So this is what it actually looks like. This is you hex dump it. It's like, I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what any of this is, but the answers are in there somewhere. So I set out to actually try and learn. I tried to actually parse it out myself, and this is me and like Vim, like mapping out the actual like byte structures, and it was really, really hard. And I was basically, it was just like, this is so much, I don't necessarily know that I'm going to be able to do this. Um, so I started writing my own parser via Tom Gebhar's guide. And then I realized that I suck at programming. And so I searched GitHub really, really hard. And I found this guy wrote a blockchain parsing library called Pi Blockchain, like literally a month before I started searching for this. So I was like, ah, all right, that works. But these two other people wrote, like this, this guy um, wrote an ebook and he published the code, Block Tools. It's a really good reference. And then Xenort987 wrote a like C++ compiled blockchain parsing tool that is good, but is a little dated because it, at this point, it was built for when the ledger was like one gigabyte, and now the ledger is like 80, so it doesn't work super well. So the stuff that I actually need, I need, for the sake of my use case, which is figuring out where this tweet happened or, or where the transaction happened that the tweet is referencing, I would ideally like a transaction ID I want the payer wallet, the receiver wallet, when the transaction happened, how much Bitcoin was moved, and the equivalent US dollar value of how much was moved. There are a lot of problems with this. Um, because of the way Bitcoin transactions work, there's inputs and outputs, so there is no straightforward, like, um, there's no uh, given transaction. It's not like when you hand somebody $20 and you lose $20 and they gain $20. That's not how it works. There's these complex sets of inputs and outputs. So you, there's like a, a, a form of almost a kind of state that you have to build where everything is referencing something that's previously happened. So you have to have everything or you can't do it at all, which I realized the hard way. There's another thing, uh, the notion of change in blockchain, in Bitcoin. So when, if I have a Bitcoin wallet, I think actually I talk about this at some point, so I'll come back to it. The payer wallet is not explicitly stated in the ledger. There's no... There's no payer wallet, there's no payer public key. You have to derive it yourself. So that was another problem that I ran into. Um, the exchange rate, there's no place in the blockchain ledger where it says this is how much US USD Bitcoin was worth at this time. That's a, meta, that's a piece of metadata that is, a, that is an economic thing, so I am going to have to introduce that myself. Um, big data, whatever. It was, it's, it's 80 gigs and it was, it's a lot. It's more than I could do in a text editor with a set of bash scripts. And then um, transaction patterns. This dives into why parsing addresses from the blockchain is hard because there are multiple different Bitcoin clients uh, have different implementations at different point in time of how to specify the address that's happening. So some early on in version one would say, I'm going to push this data to the stack and then I'm going to um, verify it later and it's like three opcodes or something like that and then later it's upgraded so there's a number of different patterns and it sucks. It's a huge pain in the ass to actually parse out. Um, the transaction ID. Getting this is actually really easy. All you do is you just SHA-256 the data itself of the transaction. Done. All right. That one is actually very, very easy. Bam. 
take take the transact. Oh shit, this is wrong. <laughs> don't don't look. I need to fix that. <laughs> Fuck. Um, sorry guys. Uh, time. This is actually also really easy. The, in the block header, there's actually up here in the block header, there's an epic timestamp that is. Um, when it's the timestamp of when exactly the block started to be mined. Um, the receiver wallet is a little bit of a pain in the ass. It's basically, this is the thing I was talking about where there's different patterns. It's in the script payload, which basically is here somewhere in the output. And basically what it is is it's Bitcoin s telling this Bitcoin script engine that it's it's pushing some, it's, it's executing some opcodes in a way to verify um, a public key. And the, res there's, again, like I said, there's lots of different patterns. Uh, there's a, basically, ev almost every transaction that I found fell under about six different patterns. Fortunately, Tom Gebhardt, the guy that I talked about, really broke down, I think, all six of those patterns. Um, version one of Bitcoin, multi-signature transactions, stuff like that. Um, so I ended up actually using Pi Blockchain, which was built, which was developed by um, Edward, the guy that I was referring to earlier. He had not yet implemented at a, in all of the patterns. He'd only implemented one. And so to get good coverage, I actually had to go through and implement two other ones. I did end up missing data about a fraction of a percent of all transactions ever by not writing parsers for every single address pattern format, but whatever. Um, I didn't really need to. And then the change problem that I was talking about before. So if I have a Bitcoin wallet with 20 Bitcoin and I want to send you, I want to <laughs> I don't remember writing that, send five Bitcoin to Kanye West, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm going to sign an output to you of five Bitcoin and then I'm going to sign one to myself of 15 Bitcoin. So if you're just looking at outputs, then this may look like two different transactions where someone is getting five Bitcoin and somebody is getting 15 Bitcoin. So you have to actually build the state to figure out where the coins came from, which is non-trivial. You need the entire chain, you need all the inputs to actually solve this. Um, and it's this thing exactly, like a wallet that has $100 million worth of Bitcoin, like if I buy a coffee for $5, on the ledger, if you're parsing it without looking at the state, it's gonna look like I'm sending somebody $999 million and somebody else $5. So you have to have the state to really understand where it's coming from and where it's going to. Um, so the sender is the public key that signed the Bitcoin before, before you get it. So basically, when I, if I send you a Bitcoin, what I'm doing is I'm signing the transaction with your public key, authorizing you then to be the one who spends it. Technically, the wallet doesn't actually exist. It is a, um, a a way to, the wallet ID is just a way to represent a public key. It's a different data format of the public key and it's basically like the public key chopped up, hashed, hashed, moved around a little bit and then base 58ed, not base 64ed, because that makes too much sense, base 58ed, um, which basically just does like, it's a representation of like, it's the same thing as base 64 except without all the punctuation. Um, and my buddy, so like you need to link everything together to make anything right sense. And my, my buddy and coworker wrote this giant big old bastard of a query that actually makes all of those connections. I'll get to that. Um, so I was trying to actually build all of these things together and like make all of these different connections, but I didn't actually have enough RAM on my machine to do all of this. So I overnighted 32 gigabytes of RAM into my desktop. Um, and I still didn't have enough. So that was the stupidest like $200 I've ever spent in my entire life. Um, so I'm like freaking out because I have to link all these inputs and outputs together and um, I have a really shitty internet connection at home and I don't have enough RAM in my desktop to do it. So my roommate, both of my roommates actually, saved the day and my roommate like a couple days ago <laughs> drove me drove me to his office where they have gigabit fiber and I uploaded the 100 gig data set of parsing stuff out, spun up this ridiculously beefy AWS server that cost me like $5 an hour. And so I was like, oh Jesus Christ, I gotta really make sure this thing goes down. Um, made the giant Franken query and then like ripped everything back out. So the actual amount of Bitcoin, I'll come back to that stuff. And then the amount of Bitcoin is in Satoshi's that's actually pulled from here in the outputs. Um, this is the amount of Bitcoin in a transaction and it comes in the form of Satoshis, which there are a hundred million Satoshis in a Bitcoin. 
That's the colloquial term named after the developer of Bitcoin. Then comes the problem of the historical USD exchange rate. So like I said, the dollar value of a transaction at a given time is not in the ledger. It is not, there's no field that says, hey, this, you know, Bitcoin's worth $100 this day. The way it actually works is the economy and currency trades actually decide how much money a Bitcoin is worth at a given day. So I had to build a lookup table. This is really actually probably the easiest part of this whole thing, but I had to build a lookup table where given a epic timestamp and an amount of Bitcoin, look up how much Bitcoin was, was worth at that time, convert it and return me a dollar value. So I downloaded um, all of the historical Bitcoin pricing data from blockchain.info, this link, which I have in the pastebin thing that I set up. And I wrote just a function that basically took, given an amount of Satoshis, it actually converted that to US dollar, amount of Satoshis in an epic, Unix epic timestamp, and it returned however much USD um, uh, the transaction would have been at the time. And that was everything. So I then had everything that I needed and I parsed out kind of, this, this is just the outputs. Um, there's also the inputs. But uh, um, then uh, my parser source code is going to be here. It's not there yet. It's private right now, so I have to unprivate it. Um, I'll probably do that today. Um, it's really, really simple because I offloaded the majority of the work to the guy Edwards um, library that I told you about. Uh, so it's like, I mean, it's like, I don't know, like 100 lines of code, it's not a lot. Um, but I did have to do some work on uh, adding code to his library to make it parse the other address formats. Um, it requires Python 3.5. It will not work with Python 3.4. It will definitely not work with Python 2.7. And I tried to multi-thread it, but I suck at programming, so that's not done yet. Um, and the code sucks, sorry. Um, so then it was actually like getting it into a database because I need, I then, now that I have this, I need to get it into a place that I can actually query it and it's actually split apart. So I chose to use a really hipster database technology called ClickHouse, developed by Yandex, the Russian social media company? Internet provider? Search engine? Search engine. That's right. That's, I knew it. Um, and why? Well, it's because one of my coworkers recommended it to me and uh, that's basically the end of that. Um, it allows views, which is really cool. I don't know if this is a common thing in databases, but a view is where you build, you have a query, and then it basically saves that query, or it treats that query as a separate table, the output of that query. So I used the views to actually link together the inputs and the outputs to create the state. That was the thing that like ate all of the RAM in my machine. Um, ClickHouse is really, really fast. It does everything in RAM, but if the query that you're doing is not going to fit in however much RAM you have on your machine, then it's just straight up not going to execute it. So you're just like, oh, shit, okay. And it writes everything to disk, which is, uh, which is nice. So I ended up with, after parsing the entire blockchain ledger, I ended up with 98 gigabytes of plain text CSV. It took about 13 hours to parse on my like i7 or something. Took about 15 minutes to ETL one time into the database. Um, and it's, I just use this, basically just read it, shove it into the database. Um, this is where I, linking the outputs and the inputs is, I'll show you the big nasty query that I ran into. Um, but that is one SQL query. So that's just one giant, big, ugly query, but I end up with the transaction ID, the payer wallet, the payee wallet, the amount of Satoshi's US dollar, epic timestamp, and the given date. Um, this is the query. I'm just like, oh, please don't ask me to explain anything about this because I cannot. Um, so once I actually got everything shoved into the database, this is what it ended up looking like. I have outputs, I have inputs, outputs, inputs, uh, formatted for me all nice, and then when I like mash everything together in the view, I have something like this. So then I started actually asking questions now that I had this nice parsed out blockchain ledger, and I wanted to know, okay, how many transactions have happened on the ledger over one million dollars? A shitload. <laughs> 60,000 transactions that were over one million dollars at the time. How many transactions have happened over 10 million dollars? 414. How many transactions have happened over $100 million? 
seven transactions that at the time were over $100 million, which is ridiculous. So then I asked, like, well, what was the biggest one? So what I actually did is I just said, like, show me all the biggest ones ever and then just graph it out for me. The biggest one ever was $127 million on November 22nd, 2013. Somebody actually wrote an article about it. I don't have the link, but you can just Google the date. Um, and they were like, I, I actually think they, they wrote like, quote, somebody just moved a shitload of money in Bitcoin. <laughs> what a title. Um, and so then I was like, well, how many transactions have ever happened? 140 million Bitcoin transactions have ever happened. Um, how many un, unclaimed Bitcoin transactions have ever happened, which means What's the largest, what's the, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What is the largest US dollar transaction that's happened that has not been spent? That's just been sitting there waiting to be claimed. There is a $34 million Bitcoin transaction that happened two years ago and it's just sitting there. It's just sitting, somebody, whoever has the private keys for it has not spent it in two years and it's just hanging out. And at the time, it's now worth, I think it's now worth $34 million. I don't know how much it was at the time, but that's the biggest wallet that's been moving around. What are the days when the most US dollars have been traded in Bitcoin? So I don't have a very good like, way of actually looking at this, but I will read to you. This was $27 trillion on uh, January 24th, 2016. Then leading that was $11 trillion on uh, January 23rd, the day before. Um, and then, yeah, there's some other ones. So any, any kind of queries like this, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of money moved. Um, I didn't actually finish the slide, I'm sorry. Um, but I can also ask how much, like, how much money, if given like a public Bitcoin wallet, you can do this on blockchain.info anyway, so this is a little, not as exciting, but how, many, how much money, how much USD has been moved to WikiLeaks? $125,000 in donations. Same thing, Fire, Pirate Bay, $3,000 in donations. Yeah. Um, so now we can actually ask questions like, what's the average amount of transactions per month? What is the most, what is the, reason, what is the average amount of US dollars moved in a given day? What is the most USD lost by somebody? This is the saddest query of all time, and I haven't actually read it, but it's who bought the most Bitcoin for the most money and sold it for the least money? And I'm just like, I don't even know that I can bring myself to do that because I would just, I would feel sad for them. Um, and using this kind of stuff, you can find automated trades if you see basically like anything that happens of a certain amount in a certain, like in a fixed time period, you can find stuff like that. And you can find Bitcoin tumblers, which is, just people trying to hide where they got their Bitcoin from, something like that. And of course, most importantly, who the fuck has my $15 million? So I asked my system, show me transactions that took place in February um, and give me the biggest ones. And I did not find a $15 million transaction. The closest that I found was a transaction that at the time was worth about $8 million. It was four days before said tweet. Um, it looks like it may have gone into a Tumblr the day that it was bought, but I don't know. It jumps around a lot and is systematically cut in half a lot. I highly recommend you pull this up um, at some point and look it up because you can see it for yourself. It ex exhibits some strange behavior, but it may be a Tumblr. It may be some legitimate behavior that I don't know about. So I don't know that it went into a Tumblr. I just, it, it's moving around a lot in a programmatic way. I don't know. This is where it actually came from. I cannot confirm that it's going into a Tumblr. I cannot confirm that that's the transaction that he was referencing. Um, I have no idea, but there was no $15 million transaction. This was the closest thing. Um, I pulled it up here. You can look at it. This is a misnomer. It says $13 million, but blockchain.info calculates what the value would be today. The value at the time was about $8 million. So then, of course, the question, it's obviously it would be logical to ask, well, what happens if the transaction was split into multiple smaller transactions? What happened if there were 15 $1 million transactions that happened to the same wallet? This would trigger, this would avoid triggering the analytic that I just built. Um, so I built a query, show me the top 50 wallets that received the most money. And I ended up, oh, this is nasty, sorry, the formatting got screwed up. Um, I ended up with a lot of things that were really big, but when I actually ended up digging in and investigating them, all of these wallets have existed for quite some time, and they have a high cash flow, a high like Bitcoin flow, so they were getting Bitcoin, moving Bitcoin very quickly. But I did find one specific transaction that happened two days after the tweet that was about, it was about, I think, 
14 million dollars at the time. But that was after the tweet, so I don't know. It, but it did receive, yeah, this, I'll have to actually go back and look at that. Um, so, um, then kind of came to how do I make this thing better? So some of the things left for me to do on this system is I actually want to open up like maybe a public website to allow anybody to ask any of these queries that they want. Maybe build a front end for it, I don't know. Um, the right way to do it in terms of architecture is not to do a one-time ETL of the data and shove it in. The right way to do it is to have a blockchain miner, something that sits on the network that uh, just flows into uh, the database. Um, I really kind of missed out using like graph databases for this, which would have made a ton of sense, but I, um, I did, that wasn't how I ended up doing it. It's something that's kind of left on the list, but graph databases would help me find relationships better and stuff like that. And uh, my parser sucks, so I gotta make it a little bit better, but that's just because I suck at writing code. Um, it would be really cool to watch everybody, like watch what happens to coins when they get donated to somebody, because that's nice, because you actually get a label at some point for the data, you know that coins that go to WikiLeaks donation link are then held by WikiLeaks or whatever. Um, it would be cool to write some analytics signatures to figure out when things go into known tumblers. It's possible to signature tumblers because tumblers are programmatic. They're software. Some are better than others. Some tumblers have like jitter, so some will move transact move money on like a on a. Um, uh, not on a fixed schedule, but instead they'll move them around kind of erratically to look like a person. I need to build an API for this because right now everything's just straight up database queries. And an alerting engine would be kind of cool, like have like, oh, let me like send me a text when the when this much money moves this place or when this wallet does this thing or whatever. Um, there's a number of different use cases for this kind of thing. I mean, I feel like maybe law enforcement or intelligence community people for, in for investigation per investigative purposes, I don't know. FinTech kind of stuff, like just having a good grasp on um, the amount of money that's actually moving every day, how it's changing, how it can be correlated with other stuff, so with investments, stuff like that. I feel like hedge funds and cur currency exchanges would have a lot of benefit with this data. And then there's some, it's a stretch, but anti-money laundering use cases for this. Um, and then there's the evil ones, like I can find, well, I guess that's not that evil, but I can like find people, like I can try to identify people making evil, making purchases on the dark net, which is a little bit harder than it sounds. Um, I can use it as a targeting platform to find rich people and steal their money, um, or I could violate people's privacy. I don't know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense here. Um, so to conclude, I guess what I did is, um, I, the blockchain's cool, it's really cool. The way the data structure, the way the data is structured is it's really good for validating integrity and making sure that everything's rock solid, but there's no way to ask it the kinds of questions that I wanted to ask it. So I built basically just a little teeny, you could even call it a search engine, that just allows you to ask more intelligent questions of the blockchain to get more intelligent responses. Um, I did this based on a post that I saw to try to figure out if I could identify something that happened on a post or in a, in a tweet and tried to correlate it to some ground truth that happened on the, uh, on the ledger itself. And I identified a number of transactions. I have no idea if any of those are him, no clue. But I do know to answer the question, if anyone moved $15 million at that given point in time, I did not observe it. I did not see one transaction or a number of transactions to a single wallet. Um, that were $15 million at the time. Is my time range off? I don't know. I, there's a lot of details that I'm missing, but I do know in that period of time, I did not actually see a $15 million transaction. I did not observe it. I don't feel like that I'm de-anonymizing blockchain. Somebody asked me about that um, a week ago. They're like, aren't you worried about de-anonymizing blockchain? Not really, just because if you think about it, Google was de-anonymizing. If you use that logic, Google was de-anonymizing the internet when they built their search engine. The data's already there, so I don't really feel like I'm screwing with anybody's anonymity. Um, there's probably other people doing this a lot better than me. I have no idea. Um, but it's good for people to kind of think about these kinds of things when they write about it or when they make transactions. It is important to know that any transaction that you make on the blockchain ledger is going to be recorded forever and everyone can see it. It's harder to figure out who owns a wallet, but it is certainly possible that everyone, that people are going to write analytics like this for, for whatever purpose. So this database allows us to ask any question of the blockchain. It allows us to figure out who has the most unspent Bitcoin. Where is the Bitcoin at? Who has the most money? How much money was spent in a day? What is the average money? It allows you to correlate with stuff like the stock market. It allows you to correlate with stuff like current events or any other economic issues. And uh, 
that is basically it. Um, oh, crap. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, two things for the timestamps. Yep. First of all, how detailed, how in depth does it go? Nanosecond? Does it? I was just curious. So the question: Does do I repeat the question, or do people have the question? You don't have to. I don't have to repeat the question. Um, so the timestamp is in Unix Epic timestamp, which is seconds from when the block was mined that the transaction took place on. So how precise? I would give it a margin of error of 15 minutes. Uh, because that's the average time period. So it's harder to correlate exactly when it happened, but it's, you basically have about a 15 minute window of being right or wrong. And I, that's just what I, because that's the average time that it takes to have a new block. Ten. Ten, oh, it's 10? Yeah. Shit, it's 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you said you had another question? Yeah, um, does, it, does time zones like East like have anything to do with it? So time zones do not have anything to do with it because the way the Unix Epic timestamp works is it's only the number of seconds that have taken place since July 1st, 1970. Okay. So, oh, but I guess, what did I just say? July, January, I'm sorry, January 1st, 1970, but I don't know what time zone. GM, GM, okay, yeah, GMT, so. Say again? It allows variance. Okay, for uh, when you start mining, uh, like on the blockchain or with the? If you were to do the transaction right with the timestamp, you can go future times too. Okay. It just accepts it as long as it's not like too far. Okay, all right. What the number is. Okay, cool, thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions? Yes. When you were showing the hex dump, mm -hmm. is it is it like a like a you know like looking at a packet header where you know these particular bytes are addressed these particular okay so that's always static and you can patch that out. Could you then, if you wanted to track a specific person's transactions, socially engineer them by just saying you know hey I, I heard about you losing your 15 mil, I wanted to give you some bitcoins, and then now you've got their address to query against them. Can you? So you're saying like. Like, tell him you're donating to him because you feel bad for him losing his 15. See what address you just donated to, and then use that to then run against his data to say who else took from or gave to this address. Um, so you're saying just asking him for his yeah, yeah. Bitcoin wallet. Hey, I so, want to give you some money. You yeah, know? yeah. You, you could do that, but the thing is, it's, the, it's trivial to introduce new Bitcoin wallets. So it's, it's, you don't have to reuse, and it's actually best practice to use lots of different Bitcoin wallets for anonymity and admit it whatever purposes. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> a, new a, a new address for every transaction, yep, is the right way for, to do it best practice according to experts. And, and yes. Based on that question, there is like a known attack vector that I guess the darknet operators look out for, and it's basically where somebody gives dust transactions, like a few Satoshis, so that you can pin that address and see where the money flows, so where it ends up. So there's like complicated addresses that take out like basically tainted inputs, and basically let those not move out. Because like when you saw the inputs and outputs, where it's basically by Satoshi, uh, Satoshi's level, like basically how many Satoshis were in there. Because there is people who basically spam the network with Satoshis. Yeah. Hopefully being able to track it, and then um, I. Uh, yeah, the base 58 was basically so you could double click the address and then be able to copy and paste it without it breaking with punctuation. That makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> that makes so much sense. I figured it was either that or something with the QR codes where like maybe Q, but that, yeah. That yeah, it was basically that and I, uh, I, I, I don't know why I'm thinking this too, but I, might, I don't remember exactly. The copy and paste I do was so when you had capital O's, like you didn't, you had lowercase and no zeros, so you don't confuse them. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So it was like back in the original design, but it is a pain to work with. Yeah. Then um, there's this project out there called Bloxier that does like something similar, but with graphical uh, relationships. So you yeah, can actually yeah, see yeah, the yeah. input outputs. Okay. And then um, my question was, how big was the actual data set after you put it in the database? So like that. How big was it on disk after it was in the database? Yeah. Oh, uh, like how much did the database reduce it? Yeah, like how, what is the size of like the database? Like yours, if you were to basically focus on keeping it as an on-chain, or sorry, like a, basically what's the current status of it? 
yeah. type model? Like, how big is that? I don't know. Um, I remember it being very close to the size of the CSV. The actual, so the database that I used didn't seem to compress it at all or do anything like that. So yeah. basically, um, I had an 80 gig CSV, or I had a 100 gig CSV, and when I loaded it in and I looked at that, directory as it was loading in. I have to get back to you on specifics, yeah. but I remember it being about the same size as the Do you CSV. remember, it, it, was it less than the full 80 gigs? I don't remember. All right. I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to go back yeah. and look. I was what, just curious. Yeah, yeah. I know there's other stuff like, I mean, Cassandra would reduce the crap out of it if yeah. you, if you like really, if you had really rigid data types and stuff like that, but ClickHouse, I didn't have as much experience with. And also I tried to read a lot of the docs. It mostly in Russian. <laughs> so like I would go and I'm like I like search like is there compression and I find like one Google talk post of a bunch of Russian I don't know what yes yeah, so another link to another Russian format I don't know what the fuck any of this means man you're really not helping but yeah yes so is there anything in the blockchain protocol or whatever uh, to stop like maybe me having two wallets and just transferring one Satoshi back and forth uh, there is a big there is a transfer fee okay cool. so the way the way that works is basically um, this is going to get into a lot of other stuff, but basically there's a finite amount of Bitcoin that can be mined. And eventually when all of those, by design, eventually when all of those Bitcoin are mined, the Bitcoin network will be powered and Bitcoin miners will be rewarded specifically by fees. So a fee, a transaction fee is extracted from every transaction and it pools together to actually then reward the miner once Coinbases are gone and once like the uh, once mining new Bitcoin, once all the Bitcoin are in cir circulation. So to answer your question, yes, there is something preventing you from doing that. Cool. Any other questions? No? I'm done. My name's Andrew. Thank you guys so much for coming to this talk.